everybody. I'm Brandy Chastain. Thank you so much for coming and gathering here during this Urban Soccer Symposium 2022. It's been, let's say uh, it's been crazy. It's been different. It's been unreal, uh, but we are here uh, in DC. And I thank every single one of you for your contributions to the beautiful game, whether that be on the sideline, as a ref, as a player, as an administrator, or as a fan. Uh, of course, all as always, I want to thank women in soccer for all they do to support and uplift women within the game, and to everybody who's come to the platform to make us better. So now we are here to talk about something that is very near and dear to my heart, someone that I've had many, many experiences with on the field and on the sideline. I've enjoyed watching the film, and I am so looking forward to this conversation about coach, and that is Tracy Ham. Thank you so much, Tracy, for joining us today. Are you kidding? It's my pleasure. This is like a dream, one-on-one -on -one with Brandy Chastain, like, and not on the field. So <laughs> yeah. just talking. So good. <laughs> well, I am, I, I am... I am so motivated and moved by watching your film. Um, I've, I've now watched it with an eye from a coach. I think if I had watched it before, it would have been with my player hat on. And I'm sure you as a former player, as you stated, you know, you have your player hat and now you're kind of migrating into this space, which initially you didn't think belonged to you. That's right. Yeah. It's a, uh... When you want to stay in the game, you, you know, I tried a lot of other jobs and, you know, you try to find a different identity outside of the game when you're done playing and everything that I kind of tried doing, just nothing brought me as much joy as being on the field and being a part of a team. So <laughs> here I am. Now you just put the coaching hat on and keep it rolling. So that is awesome. Just to segue really briefly as to how difficult it is for women uh, and we will get into this even more in a, an expansive, um, broader conversation. But, you know, trying to find that first niche and how to even, you said it in the film, like, I, I want to be a coach, but yet they're saying I don't have enough experience. And I think sometimes we think about in influencing women to get inside spaces that haven't been traditionally inviting to them or welcoming or for them. And yet experience shouldn't be the thing that's the block. So what do you, I mean, can you just comment on that right up front before we kind of dive deeper? Yeah, I, there's definitely an interesting way for women to navigate a lot of different spaces in every single industry. And unfortunately with coaching, it's not, there's not like a systemic you know, A plus B equals C, if you do this and then you do this, then this is the result. And I think as athletes, that's typically how we like to do things. Like we like to see progress. We like to hit different marks because that means that now the result's going to change or there's going to be an outcome if we do these things. And coaching um, as a woman, that's not necessarily how things go. Um, you know, experience doesn't always matter. Um, your playing background doesn't matter. There just seems like there's a lot of different obstacles that aren't necessarily common for men, but typically just uh, it makes the road more bumpy for women um, where your network seems to be um, one of the most important things. But as a female, if you don't, if you didn't go to the right school or you didn't play professionally or you don't have, you know, access to um, a club, you know, that's close to you, it's very finding mentors. Like it's really, really difficult to, kind of continue to pursue excellence and find find success and find you know opportunities because they're just so limited. Yes, and not just limited in opportunities but limited in the finance side too. Like, you know, my husband's like you spend so much time doing things and yet that you're not really seeing the benefit and I'm like, well, where else do you think I'm going to go? You're coaching thankfully at such a wonderful institution such as Santa Clara University but what does that then what's what what's in my landscape that I can do that could be comparable and you know this is not to like don't cry for me please don't cry for me but like I'm doing things on a smaller scale that obviously are not like big money makers but they are ways to stay in the game 
And for me, that's what I'm doing. Right. Right. Yeah. And you have, you have to, and that's something that I think is really valuable and something that women don't necessarily want to do, want to, or like have limited access to is, you know, you've got to find a way to develop professionally and you could be limited by resources, by your geographic location, by, you know, your network. And so, <laughs> yeah, like being in an environment, it's like, you have to, you have to actively pursue um, different opportunities to, to provide yourself with education and development, because it's certainly not going to be given to you. And it's really, it can see really nominal, like you said, right? Like if you're, you know, coaching like a lower level club team, at least that's something you're doing something to stay in the game or, but yeah, it's, it's really challenging. And you do have to be incredibly proactive because honestly, like no one's, no one's going to do it for you. And no one's unfortunately like going to reach back and try to find you, you know, you really have to put your names in your expose yourself to new information and kind of just be uncomfortable and, and make those phone calls and like pursue different opportunities. Absolutely. Yeah. I, there's two things that I heard you say. One is, you know, it's very difficult for young women to find those, those role model mentors, but when, because of you now, all of a sudden we have one. Right. And that's that is really, to me, the overarching theme is that, sorry, Tracy, now you have a bigger job because <laughs> now you are one of very few right. that can speak on this and share that experience. And so let's just get right into that. Um, you know, watching this film, like I said, you know, I was taking retaking my U.S. soccer A because they didn't they don't look at the A's that were taken before, like they don't exist anymore. Like all of a sudden right. that just went away. So yes. <laughs> anyway, good. Um, but so t talk about when you realize that because of the limited professional opportunities that also then puts you behind the eight ball in the professional opportunity of getting a coaching license. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the whole like, premise, right, for me, pursuing the the foreign license you know and I know I talk about it in the movie pretty briefly is that I had done my E and my F license which those don't exist anymore right now it's called the grassroots license I had done my E and my F when I was like I don't know 18 and 19 years old because I was coaching club soccer I was like you know a, a summer job you know while I was playing in college um, and all I wanted to do is skip the D license and go into the C because the E and the F you know they seemed like pretty remedial and they were for, you know, parents that hadn't ever played the game that just wanted to coach, you know, their AYSO child's team. And so at that point, you know, I had played um, professionally and I'd been coaching actually, I'd, I was the technical director of the club that I, you know, had worked for at, when I was 26. So I'd been coaching since I was like 16. So I had like 10 years experience, obviously not at like a high level, but, you know, I'd been coaching and, and really had pursued, you know, trying to educate myself. I actually also had my NSCAA national diploma. So it wasn't like I was going in blindly to like knowing what the licensing process was. But um, when I got denied, um, I just felt like it was this major kind of block and it didn't feel fair because when I'd graduated college, the WUSA had just folded, you know, a couple of years prior. And so it wasn't just me. I was thinking about all the other women that had also wanted to probably pursue licenses and, and get waved in that, you know, their careers had been cut short professionally. And we were all playing, you know, we were all playing on the storm and the, like our storm team in, <laughs> in 2000, what, 2007, 2000, no, 2009 was like Leslie Osborne, Brandy Chastain, Cece, Tiffany Roberts. Like it was all national pro players. <laughs> like right. how can we, how can we not like consider that professionally playing, like, I'm sorry, but that just seemed silly to me. Right. Um, and so uh, just acknowledging that there was these limitations that were completely out of our control as women felt very enraging to me. <laughs> and I'm definitely not someone that um, likes to hear no, especially when I think that it's unfair. Um, mm -hmm. And I just immediately went into like kind of started to spiral and was like how do I get around this because I refuse to do this this D license because I feel like I should be waved in and all these other women should be waved in so I just started looking and saw that you know UEFA had 
you know, similar licensing structure. So I was like, you know what, we're going to give this a whirl. <laughs> and so when you decided to take this big leap and do the B, mm -hmm. right? Um, tell, just tell, because you didn't, in the film, obviously, we don't get to know what was it like the first time you had that first meeting? I don't know. I mean, God, are we talking Zoom? How are we, how did it even function? for God's sakes. And, and then what was it like showing up on the ground with all the other coaches the first time? Sure. Gosh, this is like, honestly, one of my favorite stories to tell because it was wild. So I applied to the UEFA B pro player license. And so it was only for professional players. Um, and so of course I'm thinking, well, if my own country doesn't recognize my professional playing experience, then like, of course UEFA is not going to, but like, I'm going to apply anyway. And so when I got accepted, I had that like moment of panic, like, wait, but now I got in, now I have to go. And <laughs> I was kind of hoping that, you know, it was an interesting like feeling because I never thought I would actually get in. And then I got in. So I was like, all right, I got to go. And I had no idea how to get to Wales, right? And where is, it's outside of Cardiff. And so I'm trying to, I'm this poor administrator, I'm emailing all these questions, like, how do I get there? And what do I do? Because there's not like an airport. <laughs> anyway, so here I am and I'm thinking like, this is, I don't know what I'm doing and you know, it's so expensive. So I'm trying to find the cheapest way to get there possible. Cause I'm gonna be paying for this, like the rest of my life, throw it on the credit card, like whatever I'm going. And I stayed, I had a layover, I had a, like a 17 hour layover in Dublin, Ireland. And I didn't want to pay for a hotel because I was super poor and, you know, was like, okay. So I stayed in a hostel in Dublin, Ireland, in like a women's hostel. And I thought it was gonna be like really calm. No, there was like women in and out all hours of the night. I had like the best time though, it was so funny. Um, anyway, so I stayed, I, I slept for like two hours and then I got on a plane from Dublin to Manchester. And that was an interesting experience because right when I got on the plane was when um, the Ariana Grande concert, remember there was a, like someone had let off a bomb. There was a terrorist attack in Manchester. Right. All kind of like panicking, like, wait, what? Anyway, I got on the train. I landed at Manchester. I took the train like three hours down to Cardiff. And then you have to take a taxi from Cardiff to Newport. Anyway, I showed up and then I didn't realize that <laughs> I was thinking like U.S. soccer licenses where there's, you're either like staying in a dorm and you're at the fields already. You don't have to like have a car. Well, we're like 20 minutes away. The hotel <laughs> is 20 minutes away from the field. And of course, I don't know anybody. I'm in this like random country. And so I'm looking around, like, how am I going to get to the first session? And so I'm looking around for anybody that looks like a soccer player, like, or like in some sort of like soccer attire find some like random guy, you know, and I'm like, hi, like, can I drive with you? He's like, yeah, come on in. So super nice. Anyway, he was great. So we get to the training center and it's beautiful. So it's held at their national training center and it's like absolutely beautiful. Um, the facilities are amazing. And I walk in and you know, there's all these round circle tables and everybody has like name tags and I'm, you know, I'm one of the first people to get there. So I'm like all excited and so I, I'm walking around and no one's really there yet. And I'm seeing all these different name tags. And the first person's name that I saw was Peter Crouch. And I was <laughs> like, oh no, like, what have I done? Like, why am I here? And then I see Ryan Shawcross and Steve Sidwell and all of these EPL players and like massive panic. And I'm like, I can leave right now and no one will know that I was here. Like I can escape this. And I actually had that thought, like I really wanted to leave. I was like, I'm, I shouldn't be here at that, like just major doubt. Um, but my Okay, dad, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not yeah. gonna let you go. Well, maybe you were just about to answer it, but I don't wanna yeah. miss this opportunity to say, how did you get over that in that so moment? So my, my dad, my like basically entire life in anything that I've done that's been like scary or, just, you know, you don't feel prepared for is he just always would say the hardest part showing up. Hardest part showing up, just get yourself there. Like, don't let fear cripple you, right? The fear of not trying is, is worse than the fear of failure, you know? And so I just told myself, okay, um, you know, the hardest part showing up and ultimately the title of, you know, our presentation today is like, you came here to be great. And I reminded myself that too is, you came here to be great and that's, this is what it's gonna take. So I sat down 
and everyone starts like filing in and I'm seeing all these people and everyone's like totally broing out, you know, there's no other <laughs> women and they all know each other. And I'm like, they're all kind of like side-eyeing me. Like who's this random girl in the corner, you know, anyway, <laughs> long story they, we all have to go around the tables now and stand up and introduce ourselves. And I'm like, just sweating, like so nervous for my turn. You know, when you like forget what your name is and like, what am I going to say? And like who I am. And so I see this one girl walk in and um, her name oh. is Alary, Alary Earnshaw. She's awesome. Um, she actually coaches in New York um, and she is, she's Welsh. And so anyway, we made eye contact when she walked in. I was like, we're going to be best friends. Like yes. very clearly communicated. Yes. And so anyway, so she sits down. So we're going on the tables and introducing ourselves. So I stand up, it's my turn. And I, I don't even know what I was doing, but I was like, hi, my name is Tracy. I'm from California. Like I'm American. Like obviously like as if that was important, I sounded like, I don't even know. Anyway, it was so embarrassing. And then I just was like, kind of one of those moments. Like, I don't know why I just said that, but here I am. Um, and yeah, I like, I coach soccer. Like, oh my gosh. So anyway, it was great. And everyone's like, okay. Like, <laughs> it was Anyway, it was one of those moments where I was like, yes, all right. Anyway, but it was really fun. And everyone was so actually everyone was really, really nice. Like it was, it was pretty cool. Um, that week was tough for sure, but it was nice because it was all pro players and none of them had a lot of coaching experience. So once we started getting into the developing training sessions and um, you know, the actual coursework and the practicals. Um, a lot of the the men there, you know, were asking me like, what would you do for this session? What would you do here? And I'm like, okay. So I started to gain a lot of confidence as I was there. And I really started to believe like, I actually do know what I'm talking about. And I do know that I can do this. Um, but it was, it definitely didn't feel like there was a, a, as much ego in the room as I thought there, there would be. Mm. Um, Cause I think that they got, you know, the player, the, the men that were there were really pretty exposed and what they didn't know either from a coaching perspective, because obviously playing is a lot different than coaching. Um, so it was, it was awesome. Like, it was great. Obviously there's one or two guys that, you know, love themselves and that's how it goes. But, um, I, I, it was so amazing for me that I, I mean, I couldn't wait to go back for the A, like I really couldn't, it was, I felt like I was in a secret, like meeting of like the best minds in the world. Like it was incredible. What was the, I have a lot of questions to ask you about that experience, but I want to ask, what was the time between B and A? Uh, it was about a, it was a, over a year. Yeah. And, and was it a natural, like it w was it a, we're starting where we left off here or no. So it was a, so the, the B was actually, I think it was like seven days and the first three days of the course, you actually got your C certificate and then you went right into the B and the B license was like four or five days. And so after that, like, I didn't think that I would get my A because the A licenses in UEFA, you actually have to live in the country because they come to your club and they watch mm. you train in person. So I was like, well, there's no way they're not going to like be flying to California to do this. Um, but over the like six months after I'd left, um, I got contacted from them and they said that they're going to try this international A license to see if it could work where they do things virtually, where you record your sessions and film, you know, and send them. And then you have like a mentor and you have two contacts. So after I found out that there was the international A, I was like, why, why stop now, you know, and I'll just figure out a way to pay for it. And, <laughs> you know, just, it, I, I couldn't not like it was, I loved the beast so much. I got so much from it. I was like, there's no way I can turn down this opportunity, even though it was very scary to think about going back. Cause I thought at the, after the first time I was like, okay, I survived that. I'm done. Um, you know, but then when I got back and I started implementing so many of the things that I learned, I was like, damn, I'm like, I'm getting good at this. Like I, I love this. And I was just got way hungrier and way more like thirsty for knowing things I didn't know. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally makes sense. So can you give me a breakdown on, you know, when, when it first began, like how much time were you on the field? Did you have to participate yourself or did they always provide you with players? Like from the coaching perspective, sh show me, tell me what it was like. And, um, and then where did you find that you got the most, most knowledge mm -hmm. from, from those segments? Yeah. So the B was more, um, like unit based. So you're working with just the back line or just the midfield line or the front line. Um, 
and more like functional training within your, yeah, within a unit, uh, which was great. And I had a lot of questions and I was like, well, if I'm only working with the back line, like who's working with the midfields and the, and the strikers and right. they were like the, the other coaches. And I was like, oh, that's <laughs> funny. Like, uh, I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> I was like, it's just me and 30 people. Like we are like, if, you know, coaching club, I was like, it's one coach with 18 players. Like parents would be very concerned if you were only working with the back line for an hour and a half and the other kids just didn't watch. And they were like, yeah, so we're going to have to get creative with you. We didn't realize that's what's happening over there. So anyway, so um, when you get into the A, that's more system based training. So you're looking at different formations and how they match up. And it was a lot of uh, match analysis, you know, that you see in the film of breaking down film, um, extracting detail and information and then building training sessions based on what you wanted, you know, your team to work on for the next game. Um, it was also you know, you're spending, we never had to play um, any of the sessions when we were over there. We always had players and um, there was a couple sessions, you know, we hopped in for a little bit, but for the most part, it was, they, they brought in players. Um, and we got to watch a lot of really, really talented coaches run sessions. Uh, we didn't actually do any coaching uh, in the A with players. Um, we you did, did it with our own, only with our own teams. And so we had to film eight different sessions and each session was a different topic. Um, and we would meet with our, we'd send the film to our mentor. The mentor would, I mean, really pick it apart in like the best way. And, you know, we'd meet for probably an hour and go over the detail of the session. Um, and then after you complete kind of all your, four, you know, your different, your eight different assessments, then you're, you're ready to be like your final assessment. And it is, um, it's an amazing kind of, you know, feedback and um, give and take situation because you're getting so much information that is so useful and the detail is incredible. And they, it's a little different than like US soccer, right? Where it's kind of not like a pass fail. Like you get your one assessment. If you don't pass then like you're done, it's like, they don't, they don't tell you that you're ready to be assessed until you're ready to be assessed. And so you are constantly working and fixing things and you're running like I think I did my final assessment um you know you do a practice and then you get feedback and then you do another practice and then you get feedback and they're like all right this is your final you're ready you know go for it and so it's it's definitely it feels way more like mentor mentee rather than like pass fail I got you that's interesting that's nice because then the it's a, a very personal experience mm -hmm. your experience won't be the same as Peter Crouches exactly, or, Sid, exactly. or Sid Wells or whatever. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. So in your, in, in your, now you look back, now you have perspective, right? You look back on that experience and I want you to think about this from two lenses. One prior to becoming, you know, having this coaching license and this experience and one after what does a coach look like I think that it depends on what level you're working at um because I think that your your impact and your role varies and it should based on the level or the age that you're working with um I think I can speak to what my role or what a coach looked like in my opinion before going to the licensing and then after yeah. Um, I very much coached prior to going through the licensing process. I very much coached as like, I think just like a young role model. Right. And I kind of willed teams to, to win because I was so intense and so competitive and I had to bring so much energy and really looked at the game from a player perspective. Right. And I didn't really think as much about, I don't want to say like the tactics, but I think that there's so much that you can win a lot of games just by effort, right? And like trying hard yep. and out competing. And I was good at that. Like I knew as a young coach, I was good at getting teams to play really, really hard. And we could win games just by effort and mentality and creating that environment where everybody's bought in, believes in each other. But after going through the licensing process, I was like, I literally knew nothing about how to coach. Like 
from an X's and O's standpoints and like the tactics. And I think I could break down technical skills and, you know, like that type of the, the fundamentals and things like that. And I, I liked coaching that piece, the technique, but ultimately after I was done and looking back, I'm like, wow, like my tactical knowledge um, became, I mean, just profoundly different because of the way that I was able to create training sessions. Um, I also think that I tried to coach and this is what happens also like in our, you know, in the US is when we don't, we're limited with field space and with coaches, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's hard to kind of, you kind of, ha you have to like coach everybody. And that's just kind of from an optic standpoint, like that's your job. But wow, like when you break the game down into parts and segments and pieces and the function of this happens with these players and this part of the field at this part in the game and make it as detailed as possible, like that's where real growth and real learning and understanding comes from. And I know that's really challenging to do, but for me to understand that breaking it down like that adds so much growth to your players and understanding. That's why I was like, wow, now, now I'm coaching. Now I'm a coach and I can always like, you know, rah, rah us to win and do all of that. Just, that's just who I am. And I know I bring that intensity when I coach, but now knowing like the X's and O's and, and how to, you know, exploit defenders and like look at opposition and figure out how we can beat them and where are our weaknesses and our strengths and deficiencies and um, implement that and then build sessions like man like I, it was a it was different so my role as a coach coaching changes for everybody but I think now it's like the higher level that you go the bigger expectation that you have of, of kind of being everything right knowing all of it and that's why there's elite coaches you know is they they can do all of the things you know, it's hard to get to that place for sure. So because you don't coach in a professional environment and in the, pro and even at the professional environment, everybody's human. So errors happen, yes. you know, how, how do you, you know, because you said like, you know, I can teach technical skills. Like I understand how to drive a ball, bend a ball, dip a ball, receive a ball. Where do I want to receive the ball so that I get the outcome I want or like, you know, how do I, how do I, you just said, you know, I, how can I manipulate the opponent so that I can get numbers in this area or whatever, right. Right. You know, but technically you have to be able to do those things. So, you know, you're coaching at a collegiate level and how are you moderating your knowledge that you've gotten about tactics to match it with the technical skill ability of the player that you're coaching? Gosh, that is not the question that we all have. Um, yeah, you know, I think it's, I, I've definitely had moments with the team where I'm like, guys, we don't, we, it doesn't matter what I teach you tactically if we can't pass and receive like consistently because we could be, you could understand the game like wonderfully and I could implement all these like great formations and the strategies, but if we can't actually like hit a ball or receive it, then like none of this matters at all. Right. So I, I really try to find a pretty good balance when I look at, um, you know, periodization and, and how we build our, you know, our program. So in the fall, right, when we're in season, it's just all about winning and all about the next opponent and preparing for your opponent and the tactics and stuff, which is really fun and, and competing. But in the winter and the spring, almost the entire winter is all just technical work and it's, it's kind of tedious. It gets monotonous for sure, but man, we need it. And you can always get better technically. You can always make the ball work for you. So we spend a lot of time just, I don't talk about tactics for probably four months. Like it's honestly just maybe a tactic behind like why we need to take a touch a certain way, you know, but other than that, it's pretty much just free playing and then technical work specific to your, your position. So we work a lot on like clearing, which it's funny, and I know you're a defender, right? But like, how often in club do you ever like work on clearing? Hey, I want you to kick the ball as far as you can, right? Like we never do that at club practice. Um, so we do stuff like that because clearing the call, you know, the older you get, like you gotta be able to clear a ball. And um, so- Yeah, and, wh and where are you clearing it? Yeah, exactly, right? And so just do like tons and reps, 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 reps till, you know, they, now it's like, they can't wait for the spring when we actually get to like play. <laughs> And I'm like, well, I better see improvement technically, but uh, yeah, it's a hard balance. It is, you know, cause you want to make things fun and technical work obviously isn't always like the most. I don't know. Um, I think it's all, I think it's all fun. Like yeah, I get I so too, jacked, but, I get, yeah. 
I like last night I got so jacked up about my training. I was like, we did the same thing. We exhausted the same exercise for, you know, three fourths of the practice. We flip flopped and, you know, and we did it with less pressure, but then we added more pressure, you know, whatever. But I'm like, okay, just because it starts over here with no pressure doesn't mean that pass can't be, you know, it has to be, it can't be loose. It has to be right on because then this movement, I, I go crazy. I, I, I told, I'm such a nerd. I'm like such a geek over it. I'm like, God, isn't that like so satisfying when you hit like a one touch pass and it's like the perfect weight, middle of your foot, just like, you know, so clean, no bounces. Like I'm like, God, just, ah. <laughs> glad we I have that so, in common. I am so living in your shoes right now. So living in your shoes. So, um, I want, uh, gosh, Tracy, so many things to ask you about, but you were, you were talking about something, uh, about entering the room and being the first there. And then all of a sudden, all these other people started walking in and now all of a sudden it's like, you said, what am I doing here? I, I could leave now and nobody would know because you've seen these names. Right. And this idea, and I, I don't know if this exists for men, maybe to some degree, uh, the imposter syndrome, like, you know, can you speak on that? And, you know, how does that, how has that given your experience either, you know, awareness or strength or courage? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a real thing. And it's, it's interesting because I, and this is a, a concern that I've had. And, you know, just speaking as a woman is like, I'm someone that is incredibly confident, like on and off the field. I, I know who I am. I'm really comfortable with myself and, you know, just who I, my integrity, all of those things. Right. So I I carry myself with this confidence for sure. And even walking into that room, um, you know, and even walking in like other environments, like I, I definitely have a level of confidence, but there's certainly moments where, especially being in a new country and being around other like professional men and, you know, with coaches that are the instructors were incredible, you know, people as well. And I felt like, wow, there's so much I don't know that I had to remind myself. And this is kind of the way that I got through it. So first of all, A, I came here to be great. So like F that I'm going to keep doing what I feel like doing. Um, But also that like, the people in the class with me were in the class with me. They weren't teaching the class, right? Like they're in the same level, like regardless of their experience and their background, like they didn't get to get waved into the A, like they're here with me. We are doing the exact same work. And I had to remind myself of that. And that's kind of how I got through it was, you know, those first couple of days where I was like very on edge, like, okay, am I, should I be here? Once I started to see other people coach or design sessions, I was very much more confident at that point. Like, oh, I for sure can do this. I for sure know I can be here, but I would never had known that had I not shown up. I would Mm. never have known that. I would have just been living like, well, I don't deserve it. Or I I haven't earned it. Or like, I'm not good enough to go. But once I was there, it's like, everybody's in the same boat and everyone has those feelings. So I certainly think that men have that same feeling. There was, I, one story sticks out to me during the B, we had to do a, like, a, it was a five minute presentation on just like a system to system matchup. And it well, actually wasn't even system. It was like the front three versus a back four. And the topic was kind of given to us. And the, the man that was doing his little five minute presentation, he moved one magnet and was like, walk it and just left the room. <laughs> And all oh, of us no. were like, oh, oh my God. And I mean, the people sweating and just, I, I mean, I granted like some of that's just like fear of talking in front of people. It's probably not for like yeah. a lack of knowledge, but like even that in of itself is really difficult to, to speak it to a group. And if you're not used to doing that, which a lot of the players there were not used to doing that, you mm-hmm. know, like they were uncomfortable. And I, I, again, I just had to remind myself that like everyone, there's, everyone has fear. Everyone has doubt and showing up and like, you know, seeing it through just constantly every day, I got a little bit more confident every single day. So by the end of it, I was like, I just did something really cool, <laughs> you know? But, so Gosh, Tracy, you're, you're giving the, the audience so 
many wonderful lessons and reminders. Uh, I'm going to just shout them out again, if you don't mind. Um, one is we're all vulnerable and we all, you know, are, when we show up to something like this, we, you know, we're all there for the same reasons and, you know, to, to, to get better and to be challenged and, you know, they're sitting beside me, not in front of me. And so I think that is a really big one. Uh, I appreciate that. And, and actually opening my eyes more so to, you know, the male players though, I think there is a tendency to feel like they feel they belong more, but I guess you're right. Like they can also have that vulnerability too, that maybe they have the opposite, which is there's a higher expectation. Mm -hmm. Even though I think women sometimes um, feel that they have to show more, give more, have more credentials to even assert themselves for, for sure. a position. Um, but I, I, I can now see, thank you from what you've said, like we're all vulnerable in those moments. We're all vulnerable. So I think that's really important. Um, and I think owning your confidence is something that I've always, always, always stressed with my players. Like, listen, if you're waiting for somebody else to give you a compliment, maybe you should give yourself one because then you'll, <laughs> then you'll won't have to wait anymore. You know, right. like be kind to yourself, be appreciative of what you're doing. You, you don't have to be perfect. And every day you're getting a little bit better, recognize that. So I think that's really important for everybody in the audience, whether you're a mentor or you're being mentored or you're seeking for that, that first job, you know what? You, you, you might not know everything and you might not have all the tools, but the tools you have uh, are going to be helpful. And so be brave, be brave. Absolutely. And I think also something I'll add is that it's okay to ask questions. And I think that I went in feeling like I had to prove myself and like, I didn't want to expose what I didn't know. But once I realized that I, when I started to ask questions, it gave like it kind of let the air out of the room because everybody then started to ask questions and it was like, okay, we all don't, we can't assume that we all know something. And like, even if you might know something more than someone else, like there's always a different way of saying it or a different way of coaching the same tactic or the same information, breaking down a skill a different way and being able to communicate. So it was, it was helpful. And I found that in my entire career now moving forward is that like, I am so more, I'm so much more comfortable asking questions and learning what other people think about things and it's okay to not know and it's okay to ask questions and in fact it invites such an important rapport and relationship with other coaches and colleagues and your players um that it's been like really really useful and i think we get scared of asking questions because we don't want someone to think that we don't know it's like well yeah. no one knows everything like <laughs> hello yeah. it's okay that's why we're all here <laughs> Yeah. And yeah. To, to that point, I, I do have a question. So I also like asking a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. You know, let, let's say we all come to an environment like right now we're coming together at this symposium and we all have our um, beliefs about what formation is the best or, you know, what the KPIs are for different positions. And, you know, you know, should we play high pressure or low pressure or whatever it is. Right. Um, should we force them inside or outside? And how did, how did you see that, that um, being navigated in your course when maybe what you had known or experienced maybe conflicted with something that was being shared or something, you know, a, a, maybe a core foundation that somebody else had, but they didn't match mm -hmm. up. And how did, I mean, you said asking questions, but I'm curious, like maybe I'm asking of the um, evaluators, the coaches, the, the, the teachers of the course. Well, that's what was so great about the course is where that there, there was never like a system, right? It was just like, what do you think that we should, that you would play based on like the strength of your players? And it was never like, this is the formation that, you know, we think you should play or that should be played. It was more like, okay, mm -hmm. if this is what you're choosing, then you have to explain like why you know, so what would be the movement of, you know, if you're playing a, a four, four, two with a box midfield, you know, what is the, um, what's the key movement from one of your top of the box players into the wide area? And what is that trigger movement for? So it was like very, as long as you were really confident and comfortable to explaining why you were playing a certain formation um, and you knew the movements and what, what you were trying to create, 
um, then that like that's almost how they tested your knowledge, right? Was like, mm. and they they you know they'd come back at you like, well, okay, if you you know if your if your outside back goes forward, who fills that space? Is it the you know does your center back shift over or is it the you know bottom of the box your your defensive midfielder on that side you know and they, they ask you like very important detail and that's that was what was intimidating was like okay well i didn't think about that that depth but like you had to explain and affect every player on the field so they have this concept there where it's on the ball around the ball and away from the ball mm -hmm. and you have to explain the movement like i remember writing up um you know, a match analysis and it was on building out of the back. And I didn't say what the, the nine was doing. Right. I was like, cause the nine wasn't doing it. The nine was just staying at half line kind of like in front of the center back, like where a normal nine kind of stands. And he was like, well, no, like what's, what are, what are they affecting? What are they doing? They're away from the ball. And I'm like, okay. So I'm like, well, he's standing in the split of the center box, you know, on trying to push you know create depth and like length on the field whatever you know but like they were like that they, they wanted to know what every single player is doing and it was a big challenge right thinking about because you really only think about the players that are directly involved and you know so um it was just a really it was always great discussion and that's where i probably learned the most was just having those like yeah. those those conversations and it never felt like this is wrong and i'm right it was more like cool why did you think that and what are you missing or like explain it to me and yeah that's that's awesome because i love those conversations too and mm -hmm. you know getting getting different perspectives on those things i think is what makes the game so fantastic because somebody would say like oh well i think two and three should be inside and some people would say they should be wide and seven and eleven should be inside and whatever or wide um i want to talk about also like, just like the shades of colors that we can have as coaches and and how does that impact us and how important is it that we we have that a, a part of coaching yeah i mean coaches have to wear so many hats we do have such an impact and we have such a voice um and i think one of the most important things is just is consistency um and gosh like there is something that's so uh i would i would say like comforting when you have a coach where you know what to expect from them um i think that there's a lot of coaches that you know have highs and lows and we all do because we're all human and the way that we you know communicate can vary based on you know our performance our team's performance and you know but i think when you're looking at who are the most impactful coaches and who are the best coaches who have that X factor? Um, I think it's typically the coaches that are the most consistent in their demeanor um, in their delivery and their communication. Um, like you said, there's a, an important level of like representation. Um, but <laughs> I just, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm sure you have a favorite coach or someone that you've like looked up to or that you really admire. And one of my favorite coaches um, is Greg Popovich um, and, and Steve mm -hmm. Kerr. And obviously mm -hmm. they're not even in soccer, but they're just really good people. And, you know, black, white, just the experience of knowing how to reach a player regardless of, you know, background or, um, you know, demographics, geography, any, anything is like your a coach's ability to reach a player and make them better is ultimately like the most rewarding thing. And the, the most important component of coaching, whether you're making them better as a player, better as a person, better as a, a citizen and, you know, just like a human, all of those things. And gosh, what a, what a huge responsibility and role that coaches have, but you signed up for it you did if you want to coach then that comes with it and it's exhausting it can be really emotionally um, draining because you bring a lot home with you but ultimately like that's what makes it fun right and that's what's so great about it is you get to see your players grow not just as you know as players but as as people and i don't know if there's anything better than that besides i, I think it, I, yeah winning. <laughs> But yeah, <laughs> not even that. Not even that. I, I, actually, you know what I've experienced from a, a a voyeur's perspective of watching Jerry with his teams is when the players come back and they're now married and they or they have 
children or they're going on to these great careers and and they use their soccer experiences from their coaches as their foundation um, for the decisions they make or the friendships they make or the you know the way they do business and or how brave they are um, in moments uh, i think i think you know if i asked jerry okay what was the score of this game or something he'd be like oh, i have no idea but <laughs> that natalie kennedy she is a rock star like you know she's going to be a doctor and she's you know she's just a great leader she came into our meetings always prepared and you know he remembers those players for the people that they you know that they are i think that's really um quite exciting to be that influential in somebody's life now that's a totally that's a totally different place Tracy, because uh, this leads to something that we were texting about, and I hope you don't mind me bringing this up, sure. which is, you know, we both have aspirations um, of, you know, influencing our national teams. And that's not an easy road to navigate. And yet that's a different environment than college, for example, and the mm. thing we were just talking about. And as a youth coach, I agree with you. Like my, and, and gosh knows we've seen at this professional level recently within the NWSL, how disastrous a bad coach could be in a good situation. Um, and so, you know, coaches are so integral to the development of young people. Uh, but now we're, you know, we're at this level where it's, it's, is about winning. It's, you know, as much as I want to think that the youth national teams and the national teams are still about people development and mm -hmm. there is development because they're not complete players. You know, when you're talking about your role and as a coach in those environments versus like, let's say the professional coaches in the EPL, mm -hmm. that is a whole different kettle of fish. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what was funny, like doing, doing, going through the process of the licensing in UEFA, like all of those coaches want to coach in, you know, the first division in Europe. And so they're looking at like a lot of the, the coursework that we did, I didn't, wasn't super relevant to, you know, coaching college women by any means. Um, you know, a lot of it was like dealing with the media and like learning how to interview or like your touchline etiquette, you know, etiquette and, you know, different components where I was like, I don't know, or like dealing with a board and a GM. I'm like, well, I guess the GM's kind of like an AD, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to like find ways to like make it relevant for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're the difference, you know, there's a lot of differences between, you know, dealing with college players where they're the way that I, I like coaching this age the most is that like, this is the most malleable, you know, age for women in terms of like changing our life trajectory and thinking about the world in a different place and navigating relationships and time management. And, you know, you're becoming like a, a functioning human, you know, um, where yeah, at the pro level or even the youth national team levels, like that is very, it's business. Like it is all business. Um, and, it, and unfortunately in a lot of ways, like it kind of has to be, and I don't know, unfortunately or fortunately, that's just the nature of it is like results matter and outcomes matter. Um, and like I said, like your role as a coach, right. is different in whatever environment that you're in. Um, and you know, I think where I'm at now in my coaching journey, like I love coaching college and I, I can't imagine, like, I, I wouldn't want to move on from here, you know, at this point mm -hmm. until I feel like I don't have that level of impact or I'm not able to like build the relationships with my players in the way that I am now. Um, I'm sure, you know, eventually at some point I'm not going to be able, I'm not going to be as relatable to them or, you know, might be over the bureaucracy of working at a college or something, but you know, I just, I like, they inspire me so much right now that like, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't, I wouldn't want to be in such a business driven environment yet. Um, mm. And, but that also could be because, you know, I haven't been in it yet. So maybe I, it's like, mm. I don't know what I don't know. So I know that I'm, I'm sure, you know, like, obviously that like wearing the badge and, you know, being part of, the country's youth and seeing them on a national stage is just incredible. But I just I like my, I like my kiddos. I like my, my young women and, you know, 
seeing them seeing them strive to like you said like become you know become doctors and you know become coaches important people coaches yes coaches that. and that that's and that's something that I, I feel that is so important that we let them know that this is a valuable space that it is a it is a wonderful career it is something that they can come back to mm -hmm. And they can use these experiences in their life to come back to coaching and be a part of this mentoring that, that happens every day. I think, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if we project that enough to these young players. And would you, would you recommend to uh, youth clubs that they start their young players getting into coaching courses, like as a they give it back to the players. Like, okay, every player is going to go through these. This is my idea. Mm -hmm. This is my desire uh, for my players is to learn what it's like to be a coach so that when sure. you look at the game, you can maybe look at it at, from an analytical perspective or understand how the game works and um, how a season works, things like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, the past two programs that I've been at SF State and at Davis, like I've required them to get their grassroots licenses and they've done it, which is awesome. Um, and I've, <laughs> I think what every single club should do is your U18 team, your U19 team, they should go through the grassroots process also, because then you can work with the younger, you need to do, you know, 4v4, 7v7, 9v9, 11v11, like you've got a whole club of players that you can work with, which not only is that mentorship for those younger players that are going to be coached by the, you know, U18 players, but, you know, it just creates fluidity and, you know, some synergy within your club, which is amazing. Um, but then it also just like, I, like I said, I didn't know that I wanted to coach, right. Like when mm -hmm. I was young, but I was so grateful that, you know, I had a dad approach me, Hey, can you come coach my train, my daughter's team over the summer? You know, when I was like 18 and I was like, sure, whatever. And I kind of just like fell in love with it and I love being out there. And initially I was like, this is just like, I'm making great money. You know, my $25 <laughs> an hour when I was 18, I was like, I'm rich, you know, but, um, you know, it's like it, but it inspired, definitely planted a seed. It, you know, inspired me to stick with it. And I was a lot happier spending, you know, three hours on a soccer field than three hours, you know, doing something at a desk, you know? Um, and I, yeah, I think every club honestly should just not even, yeah, like make it, <laughs> make it mandatory. Um, and yeah, cause it's like, you just, you don't know if you never try something, you don't know if you like it, you know, and coaching right. is something they can always come back to. It can be part-time, it can be a hobby, you know, and then if you really love it and you're passionate about it, you can make it a full-time thing. And that's certainly what I did, you know, um, and it's been the best decision. You know, I, I love it. The best part of my day is on the field. So I don't think that'll ever change. And if it does, then it's time to retire. So. Excellent. Well, I'm going to share some statistics with um, the group just so we can kind of have this as a food for thought and moving forward, whether or not it's as a female coach, inspiring young players to, to think about being coaches, whether it's male coaches influencing uh, female players to get into coaching, um, what, whatever the circumstances, um, I think these numbers and this information needs to be known. Um, your movie ends with the two with information about coaches in the 2019 World Cup, where 15 of the 24 coaches of the women's World Cup teams were men, right? So 15 of the 24, but the top three finishers in the World Cup were coached by women. And that's awesome to that's just fantastic. Uh, as of today, 14 of the top 24 ranked national teams are still coached by men. And two of the top three teams um, are coached by men. Um, according to an article in Forbes in 2021, 20% of global women's professional or national team games are coached by women. Uh, AP reported last week that Vlako Andonovsky um, earned $357,597 over his first year with U.S. soccer coaching the women's team. 
28% less than his counterpart in Greg Berhalter, 1,291,539, which pales in comparison to the foreign coaches that were coaching in U.S. soccer prior to that. So that just shows where even us, U.S. soccer as an entity, value our own coaches. And so that's something I think we can all work on. I, I'm, I'm a, a former teammate uh, and friend of Cindy Parlocone. I think she's been helping uh, move the conversations along and making action. So I am, I am biased in my um, support of her, but I feel like we can absolutely um, see progress with her. Or, all you coaches out there matter. The work that you're doing matters. Keep, as Tracy has been talking about uh, in her movie and during this conversation, which is, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Keep searching for knowledge. Keep investing in yourself. Keep pushing yourself forward. Keep getting better. That's what we ask our players to do and what we hope for our teams. And Gosh, just imagine where football in this country will be if we continue to uplift our, our all of our coaches to greater heights. So Tracy, praise be to you. Thank you so much for coming here. You mentioned the storm earlier. I want to throw this out there. Nobody knows I'm going to say this. I'm going to throw this out there that there is a storm reunion yes. about to happen. So if there's anybody listening in D.C., a part of the Urban Soccer Symposium that played for the, the California Storm, please check in with us because we're having a reunion. And well, let me just say, it's going to be a storm. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a storm. So please come and please let, let's all meet up again and share everything that's been going on. Um, again, to everybody out there, thank you as always for joining me on Brandy's Corner uh, and to everybody at the Urban Soccer Symposium. Thank you so much for caring for this great game and giving back to so many. Uh, we can do great things within the game and keep on keeping on. Thanks, Brandy.